let's build a class to represent a linked list. So before, linked lists were a data abstraction, but now we can define them as objects. And the linked list idea was that a pair of the first element of a list and the rest of the list was sufficient to represent a sequence of arbitrary length. So if I wanted to represent the sequence 1, 2, 3, 4, I did it originally using nested lists, where a linked list was a pair containing one and the rest of the list, two, three, four. Now, we've learned a lot since we developed this representation, and we should take advantage of everything that we've learned. So, some of this was core to the idea of a linked list, such as the structure. But some of it was just an artifact of what we knew how to use at the time. So we can create a linked list without having individual lists represent the pairs, we don't necessarily need to refer to the first and rest by indices 0 and 1, and we certainly don't need to use the string empty to represent an empty list. Instead, we'll develop a class that represents each one of these pairs, and that will give us some added functionality. So in the old way in data abstraction, contrasting with the new way of a linked class, we used to say, uh, S was a link containing one, and then we'd have to define the rest of the list. And we still have a similar syntax, except for instead of referring to empty, we'll just leave out the empty part. We used to compute the length of this list by calling a len link function. Now we're going to use the built-in len function. We used to get a particular item at an index using get item link. Now we'll use the element selection operator that's built into the language. And printing out s used to reveal its implementation details, the fact that it was a list within a list within a list. But now we'll just have it display as an expression that evaluates to an equivalent list. How do we do all this? Well, we need two more special method names, get item and len. Get item is called whenever element selection, which is the square brackets after an expression, is used on a user defined class. And len is called by the built in len function. So the linked list class is going to still be represented as pairs, but those pairs will be two attribute objects, instances of the linked class. So I'll create a link by passing in a first and a rest, and we'll just use instance attributes to represent those, and by default, rest is empty. In order to select a particular item based on its index, we'll check and see if that index is zero. If so, we return the first element of the list. Otherwise, we get element at index i minus one from the rest of the list. This element selection syntax just calls this method. So since we're calling this method from within this method, that's an instance of recursion. We can define len recursively as well, because calling len just invokes the underscore underscore len special method on its argument. And rest is also an instance of the link class. So the length of self is just one plus the length of the rest of self, where this is a recursive call too. Now what's its base case? Its base case is when we reach an empty list with a length of zero, which we still need to define. So here's a simple way to do it. We just say empty is the empty tuple, which is just some zero length sequence, so that len does the right thing on this empty sequence. We could use something else too, or define our own class for empty linked lists, but this is a simple way to get the right behavior for len, and then that's our default value for the rest of the list when we need it. So the moral of the story here is that methods can be recursive too, and one way to end up having a recursive method is to define len in terms of len. So let's quickly implement this. The class link which takes in, upon initialization, the first and the rest, 
where the rest may be empty by default. And we bind the instance attributes. We'll use an empty tuple to represent the empty linked list, but that's an arbitrary decision. Anything would work. We can then define get item, which takes in the index that we want to get. If that's zero, then we return self.first. Otherwise, we have to look somewhere in the rest of the list. And get element at index i minus one. Finally, we define the length of self to be one more than the length of self dot rest. So if I say s is a linked list containing three, four, and five, then if I compute the len of s, I'll get three. If I select the element at index zero, I'll also get three. Now, we can count how many times len is being called in order to prove that it is in fact recursive. If I create s as link three, four, five, s dot len currently has a call count of zero. But if I ask for the len of s, which I called explicitly only once, it was actually called three times. Once on the whole list, then on this rest of the list, then on the rest of that list. Currently, if we look at what an S is represented as, it's the built-in repr string. But we could improve that by, for instance, defining a repr of self. This is going to eventually return a string that looks like link with the first element and a string for the rest of the list. Now what is the string for the rest of the list? Well, it may be empty entirely if there's no rest of the list. Otherwise, it's going to be some stuff separated by commas. So if there's a non-empty rest of the list, then this rest repr string needs to be a comma followed by what you get when you call repr on the rest of the list. Otherwise, there's just nothing there. With this new repr string defined, if I create link one, link two, link three, I'll see that we get an expression that evaluates to an equal linked list. Cool.